Uh, in principle, it should be recording now. Okay, so let's start. So welcome everybody uh, to this new session of the Simia Seminar course. Uh, today, we are pleased to have with us uh, Professor Pedro Diez from UPC and Sydney. And today, he's going to talk us about reduced order mo uh, and surrogate models for automotive research, parametric design, and uncertainty quantification. Um, Pedro, when you want, let's start. Thank you. Thank you, Ignazi. So, thank you all for attending this seminar. I know that this is not the, the best format we can imagine but i mean you have to cope with uh, the current situation and uh, well it has some advantages not many but some uh, one of them is that it is recorded so it can you can uh, see it if uh, even in another time slot so the idea of uh, this seminar is, is as, as uh, it is in the title to, to present two problems that we cope uh, with uh, similar methodologies in the in the context of uh, automotive uh, industry. And uh, the idea is that uh, it involves two uh, research groups in, in, uh, in Thimne, which uh, are associated with the research group in, uh, in UPC, which is Lacan. And the two research groups in Thimne are both uh, in the research area on high performing, high performing computing, Alwins, and the one group is in algorithms for uh, fast accurate computing uh, with uh, IP uh, uh, Antonio Huerta and uh, the other in which I am the, the IP, it's the credible data-driven models and the other senior researchers which are associated to these uh, two groups are uh, Sergio Tlotnik, uh, Berto Garcia and Matteo Giacomini. In particular, in the research I'm going to present today, uh, the people involved are, besides the, the senior researchers I just mentioned, uh, Fabiola Cavaliere, who is a PhD student also affiliated with uh, Thimne and UPC, and in SEAT, uh, Xavi Larayoz, which is a, a senior researcher, and uh, Mar Rocas, who is an a industrial doctorate uh, that uh, we are performing together with uh, uh, SEAT and, and UPC. So these are the people involved. And the two topics um, or the two problems uh, I'm going to describe today are one is the, the noise vibration and harshness assessment for body white uh, mm, uh, framework. Uh, and the idea is to assess the dynamic uh, torsional stiffness of, of, the, of the design of the model uh, in a very fast way by just allowing the user to change uh, very quickly the input parameters and see which is the uh, response of the uh, design in say, hopefully hopefully in real time the second topic has some similarities it's uncertain quantification for cross-worthiness and the idea is trying to assess how the uncertainty in the input, for instance, the uncertainty in the thicknesses of some um, plates that are uh, used to, to build the car, affect the output. So you have to know if uh, not only which is the deterministic uh, output, in the sense that the that corresponds to the probably average uh, uh, average uh, value of the thicknesses considered as a, as a, as a random variable, but what is the stochastic response? And then you're going to assess not only the average of the response, but also uh, other uh, statistics of interest. So why these two problems have uh, similarities? Uh, is because two of them require multiple queries to parametric problem. One of them, the parameters are the design parameters, geometrical, um, material parameters, thicknesses, as I said, and in the second one, the different realizations in the stochastic framework of very similar parameters. Both, uh, we are going to see both uh, material parameters and uh, thicknesses as well. Of course, that requires accounting for all the possible combinations of all possible values of each of these parameters. And when you have many parameters, you go to the so-called curse of dimensionality in the sense that you are, uh, you are obliged to see a many, many large, much large number of, um, of uh, combinations. 
and then in order to do that you need uh, reduce order models what is the outline of this talk very quickly three blocks first block in basic tools for reduce order and surrogate models second in the application of these uh, tools to the NVH response uh, with a particular tool, which is the encapsulated PGD that uh, they will describe previously. And then the third block in the application to the uncertainty quantification. So I will spend a little bit of time in describing basic tools, some that we are going to use here and some that we are not going to use, but I believe it's, it's good to have the, the global picture and then go to the applications. So the first part in basic tools, we are going to cover how to reduce the dimensionality of the data. So just dimensionality reduction, both linear and nonlinear, so both PCA and KPCA. How to solve the reduced problem for each value of the parameters in what we call the a posteriori reduce order models. That means reduce based on POD. How to do something similar, but in an a priori framework for uh, reduce order models, what we call the proper generalized decomposition, PGD. And then how to build surrogate models as response surfaces. First idea, very, si very simple, PCA, principal component analysis. It consists in having a sample of uh, large dimensional uh, variables. Let's consider that we are in a setup of uh, dimension D, very large dimension. For instance, D being the number of degrees of freedom of your uh, finite element model. And you have many realizations, many snapshots, and you suspect that uh, these uh, NS uh, snapshots or samples that you have of your uh, model for different parameters, uh, they do lie in a lower dimensional manifold. And the idea is, let's try to discover if there is an intrinsic reduced dimension of this data. And in order to do that, uh, you uh, smartly find a linear transformation from X to Z such that the Z have some orthogonality properties. And then you associate to each component of the Z uh, variance which is collected in each of them. And then you decide to retain just the first K and this is the reduced dimension of the D that accounts or contain more of the information of the model. So uh, typically, you when you have the Z, which is a as large and in principle uh, vector as the X, you reduce it because you just keep the first K components, right? And this allows you to move from the original space of the X, which is the full dimensional space, to reduce the space of the Z stars forward and backward. Okay, very easily, just using this in the linear model, just using the U star, which is the change of basis matrix, you can go from the full dimensional to the reduced dimensional model. So a very a standard example of that, that we all know is linear regression. Is in linear regression, in with d equal to so you have points in a two-dimensional space you have in this case 18 points and you see that these uh, points they do belong to a one-dimensional manifold and you want to recognize if what is the way of uh, identifying this dimensional manifold and to reduce the dimension of the data so the idea is, is simple you have to center the variables and x correspond to the center of variables so just take the center of gravity of this cloud of points and change the axis and then you build your matrix u and then you 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 discover that with just one component you may fairly approximate this uh, cloud of points and this new one component uh, you have both the transformation from the full to the reduced and vice versa and the z is just the coordinate along this axis right so this is linear regression and it can be seen as a particular case of, of pca but the problem is that in many in many cases your data has not a linear structure so probably when you see this cloud of 18 points as well you recognize that there is 
a linear manifold, so a nonlinear but 1D manifold to which this point is belong. And the question is how to identify this manifold. It's not so easy as a linear regression or PCA. You can do something else. There are many methods to do a nonlinear multidimensionality reduction, but here we have uh, used uh, uh, intensively what is called KPCA. Uh, KPCA is, stands for kernel PCA. I've written just a digest of it to, to, to put all the notation together and all the, the reference in a simple note. And the idea is that you do exactly the same as you do with uh, PCA, but instead of having a linear relationship, the matrix U, you have a little bit more complex uh, relationship that depends on a kernel. That's why we use the kernel PCA naming. And then this allows you to go backward and forward in the same way and to define a Z coordinate that describes the manifold. Yeah, of course, this is for 1D manifolds. In general, we may have several dimensional manifolds, but much more reduced than the original size of the problem. So this is just for uh, reducing the dimension of the data. But what happens when you, you want to address the problem of uh, solving um, parametric uh, system of equations, for instance, like this one, in mu, in which mu are the parameters. So the input data k and f depend on mu, and therefore u, the solution, depends on mu as well. So at the end, we are, we are uh, very used uh, to solve a linear system of equations as the one uh, you see here, which is just for one particular value of mu, but here you must solve a lot of them. And that's very expensive because it multiplies the the cost of solving one to the number of possible realizations of mu that, as I said before, it blows up very quickly with the number of dimensions. So the idea, the first idea and the easiest way of, uh, of uh, defining a reduced order model is the reduced basis. So you sample your uh, space with uh, NS snapshots corresponding to some particular values of mu and then you put all together in a basis. So you represent your solution as a reduced basis solution, which is a linear combination of these snapshots. And then your new unknowns are not all the coefficients of u, but just these alphas. So instead of having the original number of degrees of freedom, you reduce your problem or your description of the unknown to having just an S value. Then you reduce your system accordingly, and this uh, results in a system of NS equations with NS unknowns to solve with alpha. So the only thing you have to do is to compact your system of equations. This has some attractives, of course, but it has also some problems. So the problem is that you don't know a priori if you have uh, uses too few samples, because if you have uh, have selected too few samples, probably your approximation is poor. You have not properly described all the space uh, of solutions. Or if you have too many, you have also some problems because then the reduced system is ill-conditioned. So when you do that, uh, in the limit, it can be singular. In the limit, you have some linear uh, dependency of one of the snapshots with respect to the others. The reduced system becomes single. So in order to get remedies to that, for the first part, for the in the case you have to fill, you may use error estimates. So then once you have the solution, you can check if it's uh, sufficiently accurate or not. And in the case you suspect that uh, you have too many and they are redundant, you can use POD, which is what I'm going to, to explain uh, just next. The combination of both using error estimation with error control, uh, sorry, uh, greedy basis with error control is also an alternative that is a little bit different than, than POD that we are using also in some cases, but uh, I'm not going to discuss it uh, today. So the POD is combining PCA with reduced basis. So you get your family of snapshots all in the large space. And instead of using them directly to define a reduced basis, you do PCA before 
So instead of ns, you reduce your dimension to k. And since everything is linear, you can describe your uh, uh, new approximation of u that we can call u p o d as b star times z. And the only thing you do is to reduce the system in the same way as you do with reduced bases. So p o d is kind of particular case of reduced bases, smartly using PCA to reduce the dimension of the family of snapshots that a priori you cannot predict if they can be uh, redundant or not okay so this all, all these uh, approaches so both uh bases and pod are denoted as a posteriori reduced order model why is because you have to compute first a number of snapshots and this is number of snapshots you compute them arbitrarily so you you select uh in some way, but you decide how to select. There are another family of uh, reduced order models, which is uh, a priori reduced order models, in which uh, you are not forced to take these snapshots arbitrarily. So the user uh, has not to take any decision on where to sample the parametric space. And the other thing which is uh, positive in this uh, approach is that you don't have to solve a new problem to evaluate for a new uh, value of the parameter mu, but you get a computation over the mecum, which is an explicit parametric solution. Huh? How does it work? In a very uh, short uh, description, there are three, say, uh, ideas below uh, uh, in, the, in the PGD, in the proper generality composition. First, that you use a separable approximation. What does it mean? It means that your uh, expression for the u so-called pgd has a sum of m a number of terms and each term has rank one and rank one means that is a product of functions that depend just of one parameter and a function that depends on the space uh, the space uh, discretization so the idea is that this way of expressing uh, the functional dependence in the parameters in as a product of 1D functions is what allows you to make a, an analytical description of the solution. And then how to find it using a greedy algorithm, so computing rank one term each time, and then using an alternated directions scheme, which is to solve all these uh, nonlinear problems using an iterative method in which you assume that you have to compute for one of the sectional directions, assuming that the rest are known. Okay, so that, that's pretty standard. And here you see the expression on how to do PZD to approximate uh, some exact functions, which is already known. So this is a kind of functional approximation using PZD. We are going to use that as well. But typically, it has been used uh, extensively the concept to solve equations, for instance, to solve linear systems of equations. And this is something that uh, you do exactly in the same way, but you replace what is inside this norm by the residual of the equation you want to solve. Okay, so conceptually, you reduce for each rank one term the residual of the equation you want to solve. If it's a just functional approximation, the residual is just the discrepancy between your approximation and the function you, you know. And if it's uh, an equation, you compute the residual and that's all. So, then how does it work? I mean, again, we, we go to the same slide as before. You have a number of problems that you want to solve as a, uh, for many, many different values of your parameters. And here, you can see that in an algebraic uh, tensional way as solving a block system of equations. A block system of equations in which your original matrix k in the case that mu is just uh, one one parameter you increase the tensorial um, the tensorial expression of uh, k in one extra dimensions the same for u and the same for f so you can see in that way and to finding all together a solution for this say extended system of equations accounting for the extra parametric dimensions of course, if 
one parametric dimensions is used, uh, you have this type of uh, graphic uh, representation. When you don't have that, you have to extend your uh, parametric dimensions from the original one, which is just a matrix of number of degrees of freedom times number of degrees of freedom, to extend it to the rest of the uh, dimensions in each of the um, parametric uh, um, parametric spaces. So at the end, if you are able to code your parametric k in terms of one of these uh, tensorial objects, and the same for the force vector, then the uh, if you have your tensorial input and output, you use the PGD Mm, the, the PGD strategy to recover uh, the tensorial U, which is a way of describing the parametric uh, parametric dependence of your solution U. Okay, so this is equivalent to solving a very large number of systems. And the uh, say idea of the PGD is that you solve all together using a reduced order methodology inspired in these uh, three principles I just uh, just mentioned. So what we did is to go a step further and create the concept of encapsulated. We started calling it algebraic PGD because it starts off with the concept of making everything algebraic, but then encapsulated in the sense that we code it as a black box. So the idea is that we have many operations in the PGD uh, strategy that you can use by just preparing your input in the format I just mentioned, in this tensorial format. And then you prepare that, you solve a system of equations, you approximate a functions, you compute a square root, and you get the computational vademecum. This is the explicit parametric solution or the specific, the specific parametric description of your solution. This is what you get, right? And uh, for instance, if you want to solve the system of equations, you add the original uh, matrix K with the parametric description, which is stated in terms of, as I said, additional tensorial directions, the same for F. You enter with F and K in the calculated PGD and you get U. And it is coded in MATLAB and Python, and you can use, for instance, in MATLAB, just the backslash uh, symbol in order to solve the system. So you do exactly the same you were doing in the, say, deterministic or non-parametric case, but if you extend your objects to cope with this definition of tensorial objects that represents a parametric description, you can do the same with uh, the PGD operations, okay? so. All this thing is available publicly in this uh, in, in this uh, Git uh, repository, so you can get uh, it uh, for free. You see that the main soul of uh, of these uh, packages of routines is uh, Professor Zlatnik. So, uh, but uh, it's very interesting, and we are very interesting, very interested in getting people that use it, it because uh, it's always we are always learning from users. So this started a long time ago in 2015 with the first approaches on doing just functional approximation, which is a storage and compression. Then we moved to uh, simple operations like uh, division, what it is in, in MATLAB uh, dot uh, slash, uh, the division component by component, the Hadamard division, and then uh, the linear system of equations. But now, there are many others. No? Mm, of course, you can sum, you can make products, you can even compute square roots. Okay, so and the, you can compute the square roots of these objects in the same way you compute the square roots of any other object that you may have in, in MATLAB or in Python. So there is another consideration I, I, I want to make, which is uh, when one of these uh, uh, strategies, numerical strategies, is intrusive or non intrusive. Uh, this refers to having a commercial code, for instance, Nastran, Abacus, or Pankar. 
And the commercial code is a black box. You will see that I use a different black box from this one than from the calculated uh, PGD. And the black box in the, say, more strict definition of, um, of a non-intrusive uh, method is only providing uh, solutions for any mu. If you relax a little bit the definition of non-intrusive, you may accept that this black box is uh, providing also objects like uh, force vectors or matrices. This would be a say weak, uh, uh, weak non-intrusivity. Okay, and this is very interesting because, for instance, in our collaboration with SEAT, they do the NVH assessment with Nastran and they do the crashworthiness with Pampers. And you cannot make a, a homemade uh, code because the only one which is, uh, say, homologated by, by uh, the Volkswagen Group is the commercial code. So you need to use them. And you want to get model order reduction with uh, this code, so you want to be non-intrusive. So how can we be uh, non-intrusive? Well, very simply, using the weak definition of non-intrusivity, for instance, in Nastran, we can extract for different values of mu the force vectors and the matrices. Then we can assemble the force vector in tensorial form and the matrices of, and the tensorial matrix outside Nastran to use the encapsulated PGD. That's why I have two different black boxes and to get the solution. First time we did that was uh, with uh, Abacus in this paper, but uh, we are. I'm going to show today some uh, results with Nastran as well. So when you want to be strictly non-intrusive, you can do that because you only can extract solutions. And very often what you want to do or what you do is to uh, build response surfaces because many of, uh, frequently you are not uh, interested in the full solution, but just in a quantity of interest, which is scalar or it can have few dimensions. And what you do is to build a response surface by having some functional approximation of a number of points in this, uh, in the parametric space, which corresponds to the quantities of interest. Okay, so this is the idea of response surfaces. And we are going to use as well. So just to summarize this first part, um, we have covered dimensionality reduction, PCA and KPCA, we have covered a posteriori reduce uh, order models like reduced basis and POD, a posteriori, sorry, a priori uh, reduced model, and in particular the encapsulated PGD. And I just announced it very quickly what response surfaces are. So now let's go to the problems and see how they are solved with these tools. So the first one is the NVH. Eh? NVH, uh, recall that it corresponds to noise, vibration, and harshness. So it's about the comfort. Eh? Harshness is like the contrary of comfort. And uh, so you want to assess how comfortable is the car. And in particular, one very relevant parameter here, one really re very relevant output is the dynamic torsional stiffness. And the idea is, is try to assess how any parameter like uh, the thickness of uh, some component of the car, of the structure of the car, may affect this uh, response. In terms of the uh, eigen modes and eigen values or the torsional stiffness, right? So if uh, we want to solve an eigen value problem, that's something we know. And for instance, uh, an eigen value problem, just to state it in, a, in the simplest way, the standard eigen value problem uh, is finding the values of v and lambda such that kv is equal to lambda v. In this particular case, and many, very often in engineering, uh, the relevant eigenvalues are the lower ones. Okay, so we're interested in the lower eigenvalues and the corresponding eigenvector. And one method that uh, provides this in a very uh, quick and uh, efficient way is for the, for the first eigenvalues lower uh, eigenvalues is the inverse power iteration method, which here I, I wrote an algorithm. So that's a, a very simple algorithm. And I don't want you to follow all the steps of the algorithm, but I want you to check 
that all the operations that we do in this algorithm are very simple. So multiplying, dividing, and of course the more complicated one is solving a linear system of equation, which is here. Okay, so the rest of it are just multiplying, well, extracting and square root, because you want to normalize, and normalize is dividing by the norm, and computing the norm requires computing and square root. So all these operations are operations which are available in the calculated PGD routines, right? So when we write the same algorithm in the, say, non-parametric version, which is here, you can just replicate the same by replacing uh, lowercase letters by capital letters. And the only thing is that when you use this backslash, you are dividing objects. Well, here it's very, very easy because it's just a, a scalar division, but you have to compute the norm. So you have to do all the operations, as I said, in the PGD framework. But if you use the uh, encapsulated PGD, this is transparent for you, okay? So when you do that, and this is a, a toy problem that we have uh, used uh, often to, to, to check these methodologies. We select uh, the uh, solid having this uh, whole the square uh, shape in which we consider two parameters. One parameter mu, which is the young modulus of the orange part, okay? So which is variable while the gray, gray part has a fixed uh, young modulus. And the other parameter is this the theta, which allows you to curve the shape of the of the of the geometry of sorry, to curve the geometry of this uh, specimen right so what you want to obtain is the lower the lowest taken value at the second lower also and the corresponding eigenvectors okay and as i said we just wrote the non-parametric uh, algorithm and we move it into the PGD. So the results are impressive in the sense that you get exactly the same eigenvectors and eigen for the eigenvectors for the standard finite element computations for a given value of the parameters here. But uh, because here it's very difficult to show the the formation of uh, corresponding to the eigenvectors for every possible value of the parameters. But what I can show you is that for the eigenvalues, which are a scalar, so very easy to represent the dependence on two solutions. So it's a kind of surface that describes how lambda depends on theta and mu. Uh, then you can check that the green is the PGD response and the blue is the full finite element response in which you have solved many, many, many eigenvalue problems, one corresponding for each point you see in this grid. Okay. So the PGD and the, and the standard, so the reference solution, which is the finite element, are practically identical. When you see the error, the error is of the order of 10 to the minus 3 or lower. Okay, so that for uh, all the accuracy or precision that uh, is uh, demanded in the industry is more than sufficient. Okay, so this is what you can do just by using the encapsulated PGD for this um, uh, eigenvalue model analysis of this um, of this problem. Uh, but there is an interesting case, which is the say uh, limit case in which the frequency tends to zero. And uh, instead, they were pretty interested in seeing what happens in this particular case the static problem. But the static problem is, is, is just saying what is the torsional stiffness of the, of the car. And the uh, novelty of that for us that we didn't know about is that, of course, this is a, a static problem in which the loads are not equilibrated, but it has not, say, essential boundary conditions. There is no prescribed displacement at all. So the car is like floating and you have to enforce a, a a load which provides a torsion, a torsion and which is not equilibrated. 
and said, so how, how to do that? And the, the response is, is very standard, but uh, I mean, it's very standard in the field of aviation, which is the inertial relief. Inertial relief, the idea is that you stand by a problem standard where F is not equilibrated and K is not prescribed, so K is single. And since F is not equilibrated, it's not that you have an infinity of solutions, it's that you have none. You have no solutions at all. In order to get an infinity of solutions, you have to equilibrate this. And how do you equilibrate? You add an additional force, which is the inertial relief force, which is on the form of the mass matrix times a vector, which is a rigid body, body acceleration. So first you have to describe all the possible rigid body accelerations, and then you find the alphas such that this additional force equilibrates the original F and therefore the system is solvable. Of course, it will have an infinity of solutions, but we are happy because all these infinity of solutions are equal from the uh, from the viewpoint of the deformation of the strains and, and stresses. So this is what uh, we have to do. And again, these are all simple operations available in encapsulated PGD. So just uh, two slides to uh, give an intuition of what this inertial relief does. And as I said, this idea comes more from aviation than from uh, automotion. And the idea is very simple. When you have some forces acting in a plane, in order to compute the trajectory as a rigid body, you concentrate all in a resultant force and a resultant moment, and you see how this changes the trajectory. And it generates an acceleration. But this is not telling you how the plane deforms. If you want to see how the plane deforms, you have to add to the original forces, the forces, the inertia forces, the forces that create the acceleration of this motion. And this is what we do computationally with the inertia relief. You add these blue distributed forces that correspond to the uh, rigid, solid, rigid body acceleration, and then you solve the full system. Okay, so this is just kind of a interpretation of what we do. But what is important is that uh, with this methodology, and let's come back to the toy example in which you have these non-equilibrated forces. Now, the, this body is floating, so there is no other um, restriction. So you and you want to see how these um, uh, forces induce a rotation or a torsion, right? So what uh, we do is again uh, we, we select here uh, same type of uh, parameters as before a, a geometrical parameter and a material parameter and the response we get of a quantity of interest which is this uh, torsional response is exactly the same in PGD than in MATLAB. So with these uh, tools at hand we move to a more realistic problem, which is a dummy car test that uh, is frequently used to test methodologies. And again, here you have these uh, forces applied, which induce this uh, torsional state. And then you have this quantity of interest, which is uh, accounts for the angles of uh, torsional angles, summing this one and this one, okay? So the idea that, uh, we get again a parametric response with the PGD that relates very well with the uh, reference solution, which is computed by doing a very large number of solutions. Here we sample the parametric space with a nine times nine in 81 points. And instead of doing one PGD uh, solution and then doing just post-process. Here we had to do 81, uh, 81 uh, finite element computations and see if the if the uh, response was similar. And it is very similar. Here the two, the two parameters were the thicknesses of these two components of the car. Okay, that they, both of them, they uh, affect the uh, response, the torsional response. Here, as I said, in an static frame. 
No, but still, it's an interesting indication for to assess the NVH behavior of the volume-wide uh, design. So now I move to the last part, uh, the uncertainty quantification in crashworthiness. Uh, recall that here my black box is pump crash, so I'm not allowed to do anything else than just call it and uh, wait for a long time to have an answer because if I want to compute a full car, it requires a full day. So we started with um, benchmark cases that are just parts of the car, representative uh, cases that are used to, to benchmark uh, for benchmarking. And the idea in uh, the standard stochastic approach is Monte Carlo. And the idea is that you generate uh, values of the input uh, parameters uh, following the the distribution of probability you, you assume that they have then you call pump crash as many times as you have uh, monte carlo realizations you compute uh, solutions and then you post process for some quantity of interest and you get a response in as a histogram of how is this uh, a stochastic response of your quantity of interest as a propagation of the uncertainty you have in the input right that's, that's is the, the the framework in which we have to work and of course the idea is trying to reduce as much as possible the number of uh pool computations here okay so what i said mm, pump crash is a uh, white shot it's, you cannot you cannot uh enter here uh and uh what is, is, is what uh, i said and the only thing which is new here is that we want to build a response surface, physical representative, and then once you have the response surface, you can generate Monte Carlo samples without calling again the black box. So this is what uh, we do in a standard Monte Carlo. Again, eh? we have a number of red uh, red samples, which is what uh, we may uh, interpret as a, as a training set. So the ones in which you build your uh, model upon them then at some moment after the pump crash simulation you can do dimensionality reduction either kpca or pca i mean uh, dimensionality reduction and move from the number of degrees of freedom to some very uh, much lower number of uh, dimensions k okay if you do that of course you you will have the backward mapping which is simpler in the case of PCA and a little bit more complex in the case of KPCA. And then you can build a response surface by just doing any kind of functional approximation. Of course, functional approximation, which requires a, a, an output or, or a target space of very small dimensions, and you can do one component uh, each time of uh, vector Z if you want. So once you have this, once you have the response surface on the backward mapping, you can get the same uh, process as we got in red, but fully in blue and very cheap because both the response phase and the backward mapping are very easy to evaluate. So you can get this way and compute a histogram with a much larger number of values, so a much more accurate histogram. Okay, so that is the idea, the main idea that we are going to use here. And uh, for instance, this is the, the first benchmark test. Of course, this is not a full car. It's just a, it's called the T-beam uh, benchmark test. It um, this is a kind of movie of the deformation you can expect of it. And uh, actually, the thick the the input parameters that we consider um, stochastic here are these uh, three uh, thicknesses that are denoted by H1. H2 and H3. And then the standard way is that uh, you uh, assume that these three th thicknesses has, have a normal uh, probability distribution. In this particular case, the three of them with the same mean and the same variance, we assume that they're independent. You can make any assumption. But what it is important is that you generate points, the standard Monte Carlo, you generate points in the, in the input space. You use a black box, you get the outputs, and you do the statistical analysis. Of course, these are random samples. 
But the problem is that uh, as you uh, increase the number of samples, you get a better solution, but you spend more computational resources. So what you want to do is to answer these questions, how many samples are, are necessary, uh, how, how to minimize the number of calls to the black box, which is very expensive. So in, in this particular case, if I remember correctly, Mark is going to, to, to be very aware of that. It's, it's like 20 minutes computation, but in a full car, as I said, it's an overnight computation. So by, by doing uh, any of these explorations, you realize that this is not what you expect at the beginning, which is a kind of a translation of the normal behavior of the three variables in a normal behavior of the quantity of interest, which here is a average plastic uh, stress in uh, this zone of the, of the specimen. But you realize that you have a kind of bimodal distribution. So there are two mechanisms that are very relevant and when you make an, any experiment, you can go towards the direction of one of these two mechanisms. So it is, would be very interesting to assess not the average of this distribution or the standard deviation. It would be much more interesting to see which is the size of this hill with respect to the size of this hill. So which is the probability of getting mode one or mode two mechanisms, which is a, a very different output in this particular problem that the standard output that could be average or so standard deviation or any type of percentile. So what we advocate here is to use, uh, uh, in, in this particular case, we use it both PCA and KPCA. In this particular case, uh, the first uh, principal component were accounting both in, in, K, in PCA and KPCA for 82% of the information. And it was very easy to cluster these two groups of, uh, of solutions by using just one of these components, so the zeta one. Say. So what we did is, is to, and this is the result, uh, what we did is to use that. And uh, we, we made a first uh, response surface by using uh, Krieging. So Krieging allows you to go from the space of uh, samples to the space of Z, which in this case is a one-dimensional scale because we selected just one component. And then this is the, the response surface, has this type of shape, and the Krieging uh, allows you to, to represent this uh, surface. And once you have this, you make this alternative way without going through the black box, and you can make any very easily, very any uh, description of the histogram with a lot of accuracy because you can do many, many um, samples of Monte Carlo realizations. So now we are doing a low cost Monte Carlo sample. Uh, of course, you can uh, use any other, um, any other approach to make your response surface. And here is uh, using instead of Krieging, what we call scattered PGD, which is using PGD as an approximation with uh, an input, which is just the um, point-wise values of uh, your uh, distribution. Okay, so this is a, another method, just a, a, another, say, a functional approximation method based on the, on the PGD. And you get another response if you do the, say, low-cost Monte Carlo. Of course, uh, this one has advantages and inconveniences with respect to the previous one, to the Krieging. One advantage is that the expression of this surface is analytical. And we are working now in trying to use the analytical expression of this surface in order to go to get the distribution of probability of the output without, without using Monte Carlo. You can do all these steps analytically if you want and get this uh, analytical level, but this is something I will not discuss today. So another test that uh, we have been working in uh, with uh, SEAT is a benchmark test in which uh, the parameters, is the so-called tapered beam, the parameters describe the evolution of the hardness of the, of the material along the axis. So you have here, uh, six parameters and these six parameters describe this curve and of course uh, when you change the parameters and you change the shape of this curve you get a pretty different response and 
you assume that all these parameters are have normal distributions here with different values. So what is the output? Uh, here, what you want to, to assess is what is the right uh, answer, so the right behavior of this uh, of this specimen is when the strains and the stresses are concentrated in the left, and this, this is what you consider a success, and when you consider a failure is when the stresses and the strains are concentrated in the right part of the, of the specimen. So the goal of all this analysis is to assess which is the percentage of success and the percentage of failure assuming that you have this uncertainty in the input which describe this hardness uh, curve. So this is just to discuss the pertinence of using a PCA or KPCA. Because we saw in the first example that they behave very similarly. Here in this example, the PCA, which is of course a little bit not more expensive in terms of, um, of computational time, but more complex in terms of uh, conceptual uh, description. The PCA here is uh, allowing you to this to reduce the dimension almost as, as well as, uh, as the KPCA. But there is an important thing that in the backward mapping, the PCA is pretty poor. So you can do things properly in order to reduce the dimension. You can explain the, the manifold with the uh, same number of dimensions. But when you go backward and you want to generate a new sample in the full space with a point in the reduced uh, dimensional space, then you do not as well with PCA than with KPCA. When you see this example for a success combination of parameters, you get very much the same solution with the full pump crash uh, uh, solution than with the KPCA. And the PCA mm, is not as, as good. And the same with a combination of parameters that gives a, say, a failure uh, case. So the KPCA is very good at representing back the full solution, not only the quantity of interest. So the global paradigm that uh, we are uh, trying to, to, to get with this work in uncertainty quantification for crashworthiness uh, is, of course, uh, having us few as possible uh, snapshots in in the training set. Yeah? And the idea is having one of these uh, schemes in the sense you, you, you sample the parametric space. You use the black box, the which in this case is pump crash, to generate a training set. You reduce dimensionality. Once you have a good uh, reduced di dimension uh, projection, you build a surrogate model. And then with the surrogate model, you perform uncertainty quantification. As I said, either in a Monte Carlo way, or if uh, your surrogate model has an analytical expression, you can do it even analytical. Then you have to be able to set a convergence criteria or, or different convergence criteria in order to decide if the number of parameters is sufficient or not. If you are stabilize it in terms of uh, having a good response in terms of the uncertainty quantification. If yes, you stop. If not, you increase your sample. But this is what we are doing now. We started with a convergence criteria based in a standard uh, divergence uses. So divergence means a, a, a discrepancy norm used in the statistics. Now we are using another criteria to check if the already uh, the training set is uh, sufficiently accurate or not. Okay, so this is what we are looking for. We are in the good way to, to reach that. So just to closure, I hope it was not too long, just to closure, uh, what we pursue with all these uh, all, all uh, investigations is to produce uh, uncertainty quantification and parametric solutions for industrial problems. 
So this is for automotive automotion, but not only. You need to 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 do data analytics in order to to reduce your dimensionality of, of the data, and also to to combine it with diverse uh, reduce of the models and surrogate models. So it's an important point of this presentation, the encapsulated PGD. Uh, again, it's freely available for everybody. And we have applied it to <coughs> the NVH assessment and the uncertainty quantification for trustworthiness. Thank you very much. OK. Thank you very much, Pedro. Very nice presentation. Um, I think we have a bit of time for some questions, uh, if anybody wants to. Um, Please write the or ask for a question in the chat, and I will give you the word. If somebody, okay. I wanted to ask something um, because maybe you mentioned it, but I I didn't see it in the presentation. But have you uh, quantified the difference in the computational uh, time by using these encapsulated PGD routines or not using them? I mean, I guess that it's, it's a lot of difference, but have you quantified it? Well, the, no. Mm, I mean, we didn't quantify it, but the, this is not very important in the sense that uh, what uh, brings an additional value for the of the encapsulated PGD, for instance, in the NVH, is that it's everything pre-computed at hand. Mm. So you can put all this solution in an iPad or in a tablet, and then in the 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 research engineer in set can just check which is the new parameter and get a, a real time response. Okay. So you can so you cannot compute so you cannot compare the say uh, offline computing time. Or you can, but I mean it's it's not so relevant. What is very relevant is the fact that you can have that and you can have sensitivity analysis. And you can uh, do many things with a post process of this uh, parametric solution. So it's very convenient and easy to use, let's say. Sorry? It's very easy to use, let's say. Well, it is, it's, it's very efficient. I mean, in the sense, it's, it's, it's just a post process. You don't have to solve any, any other problem again. I mean, just evaluate for, and you can compute derivatives or sensibility. Okay. Sensitivity. Nice. So. Okay, Alex Ferrer has one question. Alex, please. Yes. Uh, hello, Pedro. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, I, I wanted to know about the key PCA. Um, what what kernel do you use and and what package or do you you call yourself or is it a, a package available? Or? So the, the, there are packages, but uh, in this particular case, we we call it ourselves and. Uh, the we, we we check with different uh, kernels and uh, probably the same it's not the same kernel for the uh, for the two cases uh, in what i can recall but probably uh, i don't know if berto or mark if there, uh, can, can correct me that uh, for the case of the t-beam we were using uh, a polynomial kernel and for the for the case of the tapered beam, uh, we check both the the exponential and the polynomial, and I don't remember which one we we kept because I, I remember that the exponential was not working very well for the for the uh, T beam. Okay, so you you try the um, different kind of kernels, and then. Uh, you decide that the, yeah, of course the, the criterion is very simple is uh, the kernel that provides a lower yeah. dimension is the best one mm -hmm. so you can try several and then keep the one that uh, provides a more a lower dimension uh, with the same uh, accumulated variance okay thank you Welcome. okay great uh, there is another question uh, Amir yeah Thank you, Pedro, for the nice presentation. Uh, so I have just one question. I didn't, uh, I think, uh, you didn't talk about this polynomial cause, no, uh, of the no. intrusive method. Can you comment also on that, uh, on this approach? Yeah, that, that is uh, an alternative, uh, of course, an alternative to, um, 
to uh, Monte Carlo, but uh, we we are now trying to use it for a particular uh, response surface in which we can do we can do um, uh, analytical integration. Okay. Because if your response surface is, for instance, creaking, it's difficult to do anything because in, in polynomial chaos you have to produce integrals and of the polynomials times your response surface and uh, that's something we are now considering for a particular case which is in which your uh, response surface is uh, computed by for instance this encapsulated PGD this uh, scattered PGD using a description by for instance Hermit polynomials because that check very well with, with the, the polynomial cows. But of course, if you have a general response surface, sometimes it's difficult because then the yeah. integration is as expensive as a Monte Carlo, so it's, uh, or it's as accurate as a Monte Carlo. So uh, I mentioned polynomial cows because I have seen some papers uh, using collocation-based uh, collocation based, um, polynomial cows. So b basically they use collocation points to decrease the computational cost of, uh, so they avoid this Monte Carlo sampling, and then they use collocation based. I just, I, I don't know, I, I, I am not expert in this field. I just, so I, I have, I have yeah, I, as I said, in, in, in the in the polynomial cows, the key point is integration. Yeah. So if you assume that uh, you are uh, sampling the function in the points which allow you to have a very good quadrature, mm -hmm. then perfect. If you don't, uh, then you have a problem. Okay. Uh, but this can be circumvented by uh, having a response surface, which has a good analytical property, like, for instance, having a, an Hermit polynomial in the description of the of the response surface. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Pedro. Welcome. Okay. Thank you, everybody. Uh, is there any other question? If not, I think that uh, yeah. we can close. I Ah, Ignacio, I would hello. like to again congratulate you and uh, Pedro. I think we, ha we are reaching the top limit of the of the physical room, Pedro. I think that uh, today we could all, almost have fitted in the seminar room. <laughs> yeah. uh, uh, but I think we are we are. Uh, of, it would have been impossible with with the security safety measures. <laughs> yeah, so yeah. I think that the, in fact, so I think we'll, this is a, can be considered a, a success for this time. So I want to. Again, uh, congratulate Ignacio and, and also thank you for accepting and giving this seminar. And this proves that this is a very good uh, way to disseminate what we're doing. And uh, and I think this is these webinars are coming uh, have 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 come to stay with us. Uh, hopefully, we can also meet in person. And, uh, but anyway, we'll we'll just see how it goes. Thank you. Thank you, Eugenio. It was a pleasure. Thank you very much. Okay. Hey, is there any more? Is, there, is this the last seminar of the of the of the uh, sort of summer break or? Uh, it could be another one in two weeks, but we still have to we still have to decide uh, the format. It it could be the, the last one or or the second last. So okay. I'm still okay. not sure. You will let us we'll know. We'll decide it in this next day. Yeah. Okay. So thank, thank you very much, everybody, for assisting today this webinar and uh, let's hope that uh, that we can see you face to face soon but in any case this has been a, a success as you said so so okay. if necessary we can we can use it again next next course okay okay goodbye goodbye bye bye okay. goodbye so about the video uh, Ignacy yeah about the video, uh, you send the link to us, or the video. Yeah, the, the, video? the video will be uploaded in the YouTube channel of Simni. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, you're welcome. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Bye.